So in this video, we're going to talk about how uh, ATP is produced in muscle cells to provide the energy for contraction. Now, the reason why our muscle cells need ATP is several fold. For one, we need ATP to move and detach the cross bridges of the myosin. So we know that ATP is required for myosin detachment, as well as resetting the myosin heads back into their um, you know, cocked position. We know that ATP is necessary for pumping calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum as well. And ATP is required to reestablish the concentration gradients, or at least maintain those concentration gradients, of sodium and potassium across the cell so that way the action potentials can continue uh, across the muscle cell. So that available stores of ATP are actually depleted within about four to six seconds of a vigorous muscular activity. And, um, and the reason why our cells don't have a whole lot of ATP you know, within the cytoplasm is for one, these molecules are actually fairly unstable. Uh, ATP can spontaneously dissociate and break apart. And in that regard, you can lose this energy uh, if it's not used too quickly. So that we don't have a whole lot of stores of ATP within muscle cells ready to go, this is why they're depleted fairly rapidly um, in the early stages of muscle contraction. Now we know that ATP is the only source of energy for contractile activities and therefore must be regenerated really rapidly. So the sources of ATP regeneration include things like phosphorylation by creatine phosphate, we have anaerobic pathways and aerobic respiration as well. So phosphorylation by creatine phosphate is essentially a unique molecule that you find within muscle fibers and it basically donates a phosphate group to ADP to instantly form ATP. And the enzyme that carries out the transfer of this phosphate is called creatine kinase. And so muscle fibers have enough ATP and creatine phosphate reserves to power cells for about 15 seconds or so. So once you run out of that, that free ATP within the first five to six seconds, ultimately what can happen is you can actually take creatine phosphate and phosphorylate ADP into ATP. And it's a nice source of, of uh, chemical energy during you know, you know, the early stages of a muscle contraction. And so just to summarize this chemical reaction, we have creatine phosphate, which is essentially a molecule that stores phosphate bonds for later use. And when ADP starts to build up in muscle cells, we can regenerate that ATP by directly phosphorylating ADP back into ATP. Um, and creatine can be used again and it's recycled again, uh, you know, after muscular activity as another source of uh, you know, chemical energy if it's rephosphorylated under under times of excess energy. So aerobic pathways like glycolysis, I'm sorry, anaerobic pathways like glycolysis um, essentially don't require the use of oxygen. And so ATP can be generated by using the energy that's stored within the chemical bonds of glucose or sugar. And so the breakdown of glucose we call glycolysis. And it's the first step in glucose breakdown does not require oxygen, that's why it's anaerobic, and glucose is broken down into two pyruvic molecules. Now pyruvate molecules are normally sent to mitochondria, which they can then feed into, they're processed further, but then they feed into the Krebs or citric acid cycle. However, glycolysis itself, which occurs in the cytoplasm of muscle cells, or sarcoplasm, yields a net two ATP. So that when oxygen levels are low, uh, you know, we actually can get a little bit of ATP from just glycolysis itself. Now, normally pyruvic acid enters mitochondria to start the aerobic respiration phase, which does require oxygen. However, at high intensity activity and when oxygen is not available, you know, and bulging muscles can press on blood vessels, which impair oxygen delivery, ultimately we have to rely on glycolysis to essentially... Um, you know, be a source of, of ATP for muscles. Now, in the absence of oxygen, we re refer to this as anaerobic glycolysis. And instead of pyruvate feeding into the Krebs cycle within mitochondria, pyruvic acid is actually converted to lactic acid. And lactic acid is uh, transported in the bloodstream where it's processed and stored by your liver for later use. Now, um, what we find then is that this excess lactic acid from your muscles builds up in the bloodstream. It's used as a fuel by your liver, kidneys, and heart. And what's cool here is that lactic acid, yes, it could potentially harm your muscle tissue, but as long as it's you know sort of transported away towards the liver, kidneys, and heart, these organs can store that lactic acid or lactate 
it to convert it back into pyruvic acid or glucose for later use. And anaerobic respiration yields only about 5% as much ATP per glucose uh, as does aerobic respiration. However, it produces ATP much more rapidly, like two and a half times faster, you can get your, la your uh, ATP from glycolysis. So just to summarize glycolysis, which is an aer anaerobic pathway, we see that glucose breakdown in the cytosol, or sarcoplasm here, can yield a net two ATP molecules per glucose, and um, all of these reactions don't require oxygen. That's why we have a little X through the O2 here. Now, pyruvic acid, when it builds up, needs to be converted to lactic acid in order for this process to keep going. And this lactic acid is actually transported back into your bloodstream where uh, it's actually stored and utilized by other organs for later use. Now, uh, this provides enough ATP for approximately, you know, the first, you know, 30 to 40 seconds of muscle activity or slightly more as well, just depending on the amount of activity. But it, you can't rely on anaerobic pathways for uh, you know, long-term or long-duration muscular activities. So what we need then is aerobic respiration as well. And this produces about 95% of the ATP during rest to light moderate exercise. And although it's a slower anaerobic pathway, uh, we ultimately get a lot more ATP per glucose molecule. And the way this is different is that it consists of a series of chemical reactions that occur in mitochondria and they do require oxygen. Now, ultimately, these chemical reactions break glucose and carbon dioxide in water, as well as yielding large amounts of ATP. In fact, you can get about 32 ATP molecules per glucose uh, through this type of pathway. And fuels include glucose from glycogen stored in muscle fibers, as well as blood-borne glucose, which can you know, be in your bloodstream, and free fatty acids, which can be the main fuel for uh, exercise that's greater than 30 minutes. So just to summarize the aerobic pathway, we see that aerobic cellular respiration is where we have glucose from glycogen or your bloodstream is broken down from glycolysis into pyruvic acid. Now the glycolysis mechanism, which does not require oxygen, yes, this actually yields a net 2 ATP in itself. Now this pyruvic acid actually also continues on to mitochondria and it can feed into the Krebs citric acid cycle, so same with fatty acids and amino acids. And this, these uh, components that feed into the Krebs cycle um, are ultimately used to power a process known as oxidative phosphorylation, which can yield a net 32 ATP per glucose. So you can see that you can actually get a whole lot more ATP per glucose molecule to, under aerobic pathways than the anaerobic pathways. And uh, the duration of energy provided is actually on the order of hours. So energy systems used during sports include both aerobic and anaerobic pathways. So the term aerobic endurance refers to the length of time muscles contract using their aerobic pathways. And this is actually you know, going to occur during light to moderate activity, which can con continue on for hours, depending on how much glucose you have in your body. Now, the anaerobic threshold is the point at which muscle metabolism converts mostly to the anaerobic pathway. And so anaerobic thresholds can vary depending on the type of activity and the you know, uh, other characteristics of your muscle cells. But what we see is a nice switch from um, different sources of ATP within muscles. So the first six seconds, ATP that's stored in muscles is used first. And then ten, after about 10 seconds of uh, sprinting or so, or just you know, high intensity activity, ATP is formed from creatine phosphate through direct phosphorylation. Later on, we find is you know, within 30 to 40 seconds, glycogen that's stored in muscles can be broken down into glucose, which can be oxidized to generate ATP through anaerobic glycolysis. But due to a lack of, um, sorry, due to a buildup of lactic acid from anaerobic metabolism, you know, this lactic acid can can uh, start to form acidosis within the bloodstream. And um, this is an example of short duration, high intensity exercise, where we switch to an example of uh, you know, anaerobic metabolism at some point during exercise. Now this differs from prolonged duration exercise like you know, just jogging, which can occur for hours, where if you can jog slowly enough to where you don't run out of oxygen within your muscle tissue, we can see that ATP can be generated by the breakdown of several different nutrient sources, and this is actually an aerobic pathway 
which can supply a whole lot more ATP, which can allow you to, to basically perform this activity for a lot, much longer duration. Now, in terms of muscle fatigue, physiologically, it's the inability to contract despite continued stimulation. So muscle fatigue usually occurs when there are ionic imbalances, and you might see that there's an accumulation of potassium, calcium, or even you know, inorganic phosphate, which can interfere with proper excitation contraction coupling. Now, prolonged exercise may also damage the sarcoplasmic reticulum, therefore affecting calcium release and regulation, which can lead to things like muscle, co muscle contractions and cramps or muscle weakness, depending on where the calcium is building up. So a lack of ATP is rarely seen for fatigue, except for severely stressed muscles. And remember, if you lack ATP, the myosin heads can't unbind, so you stay in a, in a cross-bridge state, which is kind of like rigor mortis. So for a muscle to return to its pre-exercise state, we need that oxygen reserves need to be replenished. Lactic acid is reconverted to pyruvic acid, and glycogen stores are also replaced. So that you know, excess glucose in the bloodstream can be stored in muscles in the form of glycogen in those glycosomes uh, for later use. And ATP and creatine phosphate reserves are also resynthesized and replenished. All of this replenishing requires extra oxygen. And so what we find is that that heavy breathing after exercise, it's actually considered exercise post exercise oxygen consumption or EPOC. We can also think about this as oxygen debt. So it's like the amount of oxygen that your body needs to take in after exercise is completed in order to replenish some of these energy reserves that your muscles need for later use.